Minerals are solids that crystallize from fluids. In the physics definition, which not only includes liquids, but also gases, basically in physics, a fluid is anything that when pushed or just lightly moved will flow. Okay, and the air is flowing as I'm doing this. And we all know when you pour water from your faucet into a glass, it flows. Or from metamorphism, you can get solid minerals that form from other solid minerals. And this gets into the process of rock formation. And we're not going to dive too deeply into that. Uh, you may recognize this word, metamorphism. Remember, there's three primary types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And yes, this is a crucial part of this. Right? This is the act of becoming a metamorphic rock. That is how minerals form in a nutshell. But there are different ways they can do this. And I'm going to break those ways out for you because this definition is still kind of vague. All right, there are basically five ways minerals can form. And, well, minerals are made of crystals. XL is abbreviation for crystal. Flap an S on the end of it, crystals. Form from one of five different mechanisms, and I'm gonna talk about each one of those five, one at a time for you. The primary way for crystals to form is from molten material or melts. This is how most igneous rocks will form. And why am I saying melts? Well, you guys may be familiar with the terms lava and magma. The only difference between a lava and a magma is a magma is underground, a lava is on the surface. I personally am not a fan of either of those terms, so I use the term melts. Well, where do these melts come from? Well, the Earth is constantly in motion. Plate tectonics are moving things around, can be relieved of pressure or water introduced, and it will melt into a liquid. And liquids are not minerals, and thus they are not rocks. The crystals form from this molten material or this melt. If it's usually a lava, you know, a melt that cools on the surface, it's exposed to something like the atmosphere or in water, and it tends to cool a lot quicker. So you get aphanitic or finer grained rocks, stuff where the crystals are not obvious. And this leads to rocks such as basalts, rhyolites, dacites, those kind of igneous rocks. If you cool underground, you tend to be more insulated, so you lose heat more slowly and you will form better crystals and you will get granitic type rocks. You will get rocks like this, which is probably a granite. I don't know for sure. I can tell it has quartz in it though. So you get your granites, you get your things like the sodalite rich rocks that I showed you in video four and other coarse grain igneous rocks. Number two, precipitation. This would actually include some sedimentary rocks. Okay, not all of them, but some. Most sedimentary rocks are derived from other rocks, but sediments can form from precipitation. What do I mean for by precipitation from a solution? Basically, anything that crystallizes out of water. You like great salt flats. You can even get carbonates that precipitate out of the seawater, and even some iron-rich compounds as well. These are all minerals that form from precipitation. A third way is condensation from the air. I just went on this long rant about how ice is a mineral and thus a rock. Well, you can either freeze water directly, seawater, fresh water, whatever, or it can fall from the sky in the form of snow. That's what this is. Number four is metamorphism from existing solids rocks or minerals mostly, without actual melting taking place. This can be mineraloids as well and things like that. That's why I wrote solids and not minerals. But if melting occurs, then you no longer have metamorphism. What you have is molten material, which would kick us back up to number one. So the rocks don't melt. Well, how does this work? Well, I've mentioned plate tectonics already, so I'm gonna mention it again. Well, when two tectonic plates collide, they can form mountains. We call that an orogenic event or an orogeny. And that creates a lot of heat and pressure. 
And what that can do is alter the chemistry of the rocks without melting them. Sometimes melting does occur, but it doesn't have to. This is a book I wrote with a, with a colleague uh, probably five years ago now. And in it, we discuss concepts of metamorphic nodes. Just because an area no longer has a mountain range doesn't mean one didn't exist. Erosion happens. And the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has several of these nodes. And basically what that means is as a rock becomes metamorphosed, it will undergo chemical change. Remember how I said cooling directly from melt, you can exchange ions? Well, you can do that too through metamorphism and you'll get other minerals. And just like in the last video, I mentioned garnets are important to metamorphism. Well, that's because they are one of these metamorphic facies and these will tell you what kind of general grade of metamorphism that you have. Right, as metamorphism occurs, it will go from a low to a high grade of metamorphism. Now, it doesn't have to do this, it can stop. You can start out low, go to medium and stop. You can go all the way to high or you can stay at low. It doesn't really matter. And actually, the whole concept of metamorphic nodes is the further you get from the most metamorphic area, highly metamorphosed area, like when the page I just showed you, you have these mineral assemblages and the metamorphism fades. Now, these are minerals typically associated with each grade of metamorphism here. Low, you have chlorite and biotite. Medium, you have garnet and star starlite. And at high, you have sylmanite. This is common in the Upper Peninsula. You have other minerals that can do this too, but you need what we call a parent rock, or a rock with the chemistry to do this, to get this type of mineral transgression, and it can help you identify these. And the type of rock that works really well for that are what we call mudstones, shales, slates, to lesser degree siltstones, those kind of things. This doesn't work with things like quartzites, which are a metamorphic rock, because quartz is stable throughout the metamorphic process, and it doesn't work with things like marble, which came from carbonate rocks like limestone and dolostone, because those are also really stable throughout the metamorphic process. So you need a kind of clay-rich rock in order to see something like this occur. And this all occurs with no melting. It's all ion exchange and a rearrangement of the minerals. There are things like beautiful garnet schists, where the garnets are just growing out of what used to be a shale. It really produces some really beautiful rocks. One more quick thing is the metamorphic process does form metamorphic rocks. So you can see how all this stuff is kind of tied together. We've had the first one, which produces mostly igneous rocks. The second one, sedimentary rocks. This one forms metamorphic rocks derived mostly from sedimentary rocks, but it can happen with igneous rocks as well, because metamorphic rocks can be derived from igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, or other metamorphic rocks. The fifth and final way, and a way that is unique to Earth, as far as we know, that will form minerals is a process called biodeposition. These are minerals that form directly from living things that are still alive like corals or dead things, you know, that die and their skeletons get deposited on the seafloor or lake floor or whatever. There are no real living organisms that deposit iron oxides anymore. One of the oldest organisms on earth are called stromatolites. They're still alive today. Uh, most live in salty seawater or lakes that are saline rich. There aren't too many freshwater versions left. And those are talks for other times. There used to be. Stromatolites are the only macro scale fossils that we have in the Precambrian. What you see here are some different types of how they can grow. Sometimes they can be matted, they can be mounded, they can even form columns. But basically, every stromatolite. How they grow is in the cross section. This is say this is your sea bottom. Here's my waves. Basically, what you have is you have a bunch of stromatolites. They exist as single-celled organisms that live together, and they will eat 
and produce waste and then they die. Well, that stays there. The next generation is on top of them. And then those eat, live, die, do their thing, etc., etc., etc. And you can get these structures like mounds and columns. That's how they grow. Also, one of the stops from this book here, and I'm just going to show you the actual book because the photos are really hard for me to dig out. In the Upper Peninsula of Michigan are beautiful stromatolites right at this outcrop along the road. Okay, I think that's it. I think I'm going to wrap it up. And as usual, I hope you guys learned something.